Good morning and welcome to our webinar, Managing Non-Alcoholic Fatty Liver Disease in General Practice in partnership with St George Hospital. My name is Bertha Harvey and I'm the CPD and Events Manager with Central East and Sydney PHN. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians and sovereign people across the land which we work. We recognise the continuing connection to land, water and community and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. We also extend that respect to any Aboriginal colleagues who may be joining us today. I would like to introduce Carly Stevens, who is a clinical nurse consultant, and Dr Chen, who is a gastroenterologist at St George Hospital. Um, over to you, Carly. Thank you. And thank you all so much for attending our session today. So um, as just mentioned, my name is Carly Stevens, and I'm the clinical nurse consultant for hepatology at St George Hospital. Before we start the presentation, I would love to introduce my colleague, Dr. Fei Chen, who will be leading the presentation with us today. Now, the title, sorry, the presentation today is titled Managing Risk Factors for NAFLD to Delay Progression to Chronic Liver Disease. We are lucky to have Dr. Chen as one of our consultant hepatologists here at St. George Hospital, specialising in the management of chronic liver disease with a special interest in the management of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Dr. Chen recently completed her PhD studying the pathogenesis of NAFLD in lean individuals. Her study pioneered our understanding of this area with a landmark paper published in a high impact journal being highly cited. Before we begin though, I would like to highlight, and Faye, I will get you to pop up that slide, thank you. Um, highlight that this education program works towards the aims of the St. George Hospital Integrated Care Chronic Disease Working Party with an overall goal to provide transparency and improve communication between primary and tertiary care. One of the main focuses of the working party is to utilize the skills and the knowledge of the chronic disease CNC, such as myself, in an attempt to bridge the communication gap between general practice and the hospital. So my role as a hepatology CNC is to manage patients with advanced liver disease within a nurse led model of care. My aim is to reduce mortality and morbidity with the introduction of preventative strategies and outpatient management. Unfortunately, however, patients with advanced liver disease often do require hospital admissions. So my role in that instance is to act as a point of contact for not just patients on discharge, but also their primary care providers. And for that reason, patients discharged under our service have my contact details listed on their discharge summaries for ease of communication with general practitioners and for the preventions of readmission and deterioration. At the end of Dr Chen's talk this morning, I'll also attach the contact details for our service, as well as update you on our new referral process, which has recently been disseminated through the St George Division of General Practices. But for now, I will hand the floor over to Dr Chen and following her presentation, we will also have some time for questions as well. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, Bertha and Carly, for the kind introduction. So as they've said, my name is Faye. I'm one of the staff specialists at St. George Hospital and I do the liver clinic there as well. And today we're gonna focus our talks on one of the topics that have been emerging and have been quite hot in the last couple of years, which is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We'll focus our talk today on mainly to review the key elements of fatty liver disease and what are the to identify risk factors associated with disease progression, We'll also review the disease making process regarding appropriate triaging and referral to specialty services within the St. George Hospital Liver Clinic. And we'll also touch on some management uh, points of patients with NAFLD risk factors when the referrals to services is not indicated. And also discussion regarding what are the available options pharmacologically and non-pharmacologically in terms of management of patients with fatty liver disease to prevent disease progression. So just to start off, uh, firstly, this has been going on in the last couple of years, but there has been a big consensus globally that has proposed to rename the disease NAFLD to MAFLD, which stands for Metabolic Associated Fatty Liver Disease. Now, the background of this is that NAFLD, even though it shares a common pathogenesis or common disease process, it's very confusing when we consider non-alcoholic fatty liver disease versus alcoholic fatty liver disease. Although these two end up with hepatic steatosis, it's not a good description of their pathogenesis. So it has been proposed that NAFLD be called MAFLD. And the criteria for diagnosing MAFLD are those 
that in any patients who has hepatic steatosis with at least one metabolic risk factor. So if you've got hepatic steatosis plus your overweight, uh, which is the cutoff is 25 in Caucasians and 23 in Asians, then you automatically qualify as methyl. Or if you have hepatic steatosis plus type 2 diabetes, then you also qualify to be diagnosed as methyl. Those with normal weight, however, such as the uh, lean people, they need to have at least two metabolic risk factors, which are listed um, in that table there. So either high waist circumference, uh, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, or low HDL cholesterols, pre-diabetes, um, or HOMA insulin resistance scores of more than 2.5, or high sensitivity CRP levels of more than two. And if they do have significant alcohol intake, then we tend to describe them as having dual pathology of alcoholic and metabolic associated fatty liver disease. So what are the global prevalence of NAFOL? Uh, of NAFOL? In the last couple of years, the incidence of and prevalence of NAFOL have been increasing. And this is not just in the first world countries such as Australia, but it's also happening in third, a lot of the third world countries as well. And looking at the adult transplant diagnosis and, uh, and criteria, it's really interesting that in the first couple of decades before the year 2000, NAFOL is not very well recognized, as you can see on the green line. In fact, a lot of these people were actually classified as having other diagnoses. So that's why there were high numbers of percentage of patients with other causes of liver failure as an indication of transplant. But from the year 2000 onwards, people start to recognize this disease process called fatty liver disease. And the incidence and criteria for transplant diagnosis from NAFOL starts to then increase. It's also interesting to note here as well about hepatitis C, which is the purple line, uh, that the incidence of transplant diagnosis increases significantly after the year 2000. But after the year 2013, when the era of direct death directly acting um, antivirals start to become available, the number of people transplanted for hepatitis C virus has significantly decreased. So even though NAFOL itself is a disease, it is a continuum of a couple of stages like a lot of other disease process. We start off with normal liver and people then start depositing fat inside the liver. So these are people who are classified as having steatosis. Within that, there are different degrees of severity. So first, there is just simple fat with little or no inflammation, which is completely benign. But when that inflammation starts to become more significant on where, or when the hepatocyte starts to balloon up, this then tends to cause damage to the liver cells. Alongside ballooning of the hepatocytes, you also get deposition and development of scar tissues or scarring, which initially will be quite mild, but in the advanced stages, as seen here towards the right, scarring can eventually lead to cirrhosis and significant architectural change. And with that, patients are then at risk of portal hypertension and all the cirrhotic complications such as liver cancer. So the key point here is that fibrosis ultimately leads to major morbidity and mortality in patients with NAFOL. And these are the patients who eventually may need liver transplants and who develop liver cancer. So interventions earlier in this disease continuum can have benefit in keeping patients from progressing to that point. So it is also important to note that hepatic steatosis can be caused by a lot of other things, not just non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So we, excessive alcohol consumption, for example, is a very common cause of hepatic steatosis. Hepatitis C, especially genotype 3, uh, starvation, TPN, a lot of the medications that we commonly use for this patient, such as steroids, amiodarone, methotrexate, tamoxifen, as well as a number of other congenital things like inborn error of metabolism, fat liver of pregnancies, and so on. So who are at risk of methyl progression? So obesity and type 2 diabetes have been highlighted as the highest risk of patients to progress to NASH cirrhosis. But other risk factors such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia, heavy alcohol consumption, or having any family history of fatty liver or metabolic disease can also increase their risk of disease progression. So looking at the mortality risk associated with NAFOL versus NASH, so this study examined the mortality risk of patients without NAFOL, with NAFOL, and with NASH. 
So patients in patients with bad NAFL, there is some baseline cardiovascular risk in the general population. Roughly about a third of them is contributed by cardiovascular death. But in those who develop non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, the bar indicating mortality risk due to cardiovascular disease has doubled in size, indicating that the risk of them dying from cardiovascular disease significantly increased once they've developed non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So this indicates that simply having excessive fat in the liver, even without the NASH, doubles the risk of death from cardiovascular disease. But for those who then progress to NASH, the great bar then greatly expands because NASH increases the risk of progression to cirrhosis and a lot of the liver disease-related death. So let's just talk about what uh, the goals of diagnosing and prognosticating NASH patients. So one goal is to identify people in the red line here, who um, people who have NASH because they're at risk of fibrosis. So it is important to identify patients who have advanced fibrosis. As you can see here, patients who have very little or no fibrosis have similar mortality curve to those who have no fatty liver disease. But as their fibrosis progresses with stage two onwards, their survivor curves tend starts to drop off so that patients with F3 and F4 have a much higher mortality rate. So this suggests that having any scar tissue on, in the liver is a concern, especially anything higher than F1. So there have been two recent big natural history studies of over 20 years follow-up of, of over eight, involving over 800 patients that suggests that liver fibrosis is the only factor that independently predicts all-cause mortality, liver-specific mortality, liver transplantations, and liver-specific morbidities in NAFLD patients. It doesn't mean that all the other factors are not important, but this just indicates that the outcomes of NAFLD really depend on how effectively the liver can repair the injury or regenerate. So the severity of liver injury, such as the hepatocyte ballooning, together with certain clinical factors such as the age, type 2 diabetes, as well as their background genetic and epigenetic factors, can regulate their genetic uh, re regenerative processes to tissue injury. So how well they repair their injuries depends on all these other risk factors, but really the factors that predicts their mortality overall is the liver fibrosis itself. So how do we predict fibrosis? First thing to note is this NAFLD activity score, which the histopathologists use. And this is based on tissue diagnosis. So this is only used if you have tissue diagnosis and liver biopsy. There are other plasma biomarkers uh, which are available to predict fibrosis as well. Obviously, they all have different uh, performance status. And it is important to note that not all of these are readily available. For example, the ProC3 it's not readily available. <clears throat> it is used in a lot of the clinical trials, but it's not used widely cl uh, clinically. <laughs> the fiber scan is very commonly used clinically. So it is very liable to rule out advanced hepatic fibrosis. Um, so here on the left, we've got the what different levels of fibrosis looks like histologically. So this is the Mason Tricon strain, uh, stain. So the blue indicates fibrosis. So as you can see in the F4 stage, as you get towards the more advanced fibrosis, you get big, thick bands of fibrosis scarring here. So fiber scan is good at detecting the extreme levels of fibrosis. So it is good at the F3, F4 levels, and it is good at the F0, F1 levels. So less than six kilopascals. <clears throat> But there is um, a little bit of overestimations which can happen when the patients are a bit obese or when the patients have active hepatitis or cholestasis or congestions or when they have mass lesions. So it is just important to keep that in mind as well. And fiber scan score also correlates very well with portal pressures. So there has been said that we don't need to diagnose, diagnose NAFL because there is no treatment available. But those of us who are working in the field know that this is really not true because it is important that we identify patients with risk of fibrosis. And we do have a number of drugs which are available on clinical trials now um, and are in development for NASH as well. So really what, when we talk about the goals of NASH treatments, 
The goal is to prevent long-term morbidity, morbidity and mortality. So this includes avoiding cirrhosis and all the liver-related morbidity and complications, avoiding HCC, liver transplantations, um, but also <coughs> preventing cardiovascular morbidity and, morbidity and mortality, which is the number one cause of death in patients with NASH, <clears throat> especially if they have type 2 diabetes as well. So the goals of treatment is twofold. Firstly, we need to prevent liver-related morbidity and mortality, and then ultimately prevent cardiovascular morbidity and mortality as well. <clears throat> so firstly, weight loss in MAFLD, and this is the, the most important single um, form of intervention or management of MAFLD patients. So which patients should we be thinking about um, weight loss in MAFLD and what are the options? So this is a nice diagram from the Endocrine Society, um, which shows the guidance around management of obesity. So there's a few components here. So at the base, there's lifestyle and behavioral modifications. So here we start thinking about how we approach food and exercise. And really these things need to be a part of everyone's lifestyle anyway, regarding of, regardless of how obese or overweight they are. But as their weight increases, we need to start thinking about adding things like drug therapy or pharmacotherapies. And if their weight increases further, then we need to add on things such as bariatric surgery or endoscopic surgery for weight loss. But what is the cutoff of, to start thinking about drug therapy? So generally, if someone has a body max index of above 30 without any risk factors, that's when we start to think about using pharmacotherapy as an adjunct to weight loss. And if they have a BMI of 27, however, and they have comorbidities such as fatty liver disease or metabolic syndrome, then we can start thinking about drug therapy. And for bariatric surgery, the cutoff tends to be about a bit higher. So it's generally more than 40 or more than 35 if they have comorbidity. And, and the next question is how much weight loss needs to be achieved in the setting of fatty liver disease? So of course, there are, very, uh, there are a lot of trials uh, in standalone obesity, but what do, we know, what do we know about management of weight loss in people with fatty liver disease? So if you look at in the right side of this slide, it's actually not really very reassuring. Of all the literature published, and there's not a lot of this, only about 30% of patients who achieve 5% of, of weight loss or more in one year can maintain that. And that's just achieving it. Maintaining it is going to be quite different. It's going to be more difficult. And as we move up the chart, people lose, as people lose more weight, the percentage of people able to maintain that weight loss decreases. So this tells us that lifestyle modification is really difficult to implement as well as to maintain. But what actually happens histologically when they lose this weight? So when you start to lose more than 5%, you start to see significant improvement of fat and steatosis in the liver. And as you get to 7%, you start to see quite a significant effect on the inflammatory injury. So a lot of the patients no longer have NASH and they no longer have that hepatocyte ballooning. And once you go above 10%, you start to see quite an impressive effect on fibrosis. And the rest is stabilizing as well. You don't see any worsening. So I think it's a good balance that you tell patients to aim for about seven to 10% of weight loss, because that's potentially something they can aim for, which um, and easier to maintain, but they also have significant benefits from it. And we're talking about seven to 8% of their body weight over a year. We don't actually want them to lose the weight too quickly as well. What about drug therapies? So there are a large number of drug therapies available and in use. Um, but drugs like Orlistat, for example, we can, uh, we can see about 8% of weight loss. And some of the GLP-1 ag agonists, such as liraglutide, we can see a little bit more, such as 5 to 10% of the weight loss, and sometimes even up to 12%. But what about their effects on fatty liver disease? In a lot of the cases, it hasn't really been studied in great details. There are a lot of small studies, but not really high quality data in terms of NASH. And what about surgery? So many of you are familiar with the main types of bariatric surgeries that are performed. Adjustable gastric banding is used less and less today because not only do they only produce small degree of weight loss, 
they're not also reliable and they can be associated with weight regain again. So the main procedures that we perform now for weight loss are mainly vertical sleeve gastrectomy or the Ruin Y gastric bypass. And these procedures can result in 20 to 30% of weight loss and improvement in a lot of the weight related complications such as resolution of diabetes, improvement of sleep apnea, lipids profile and hypertension. But what about their effect on NASH and their liver histology? So the short answer is they do improve the liver histology. This is a study that was based on more than 100 patients who had biopsy proven NASH. So in this particular cohort, there was substantial reduction of BMI down from 49 to 37. And there was, this was also associated with significant improvement in the liver injury. So 85% of them had resolution of NASH, 34 of them had improvement of fibrosis. And these are pretty significant findings. So how do we summarize all this together? The key here is to try and make sure people can adopt lifestyle change, make those changes to their diet and exercise and maintain them. So with diet, exercise and lifestyle, we're looking at about five to 8% of weight loss. But if in the best case scenario, but if you're looking at more weight loss, then you're really looking at adopting some pharmacological agent, which can give you up to 10% of weight loss. And if you need more weight loss, then it's really the bariatric surgery or endoscopic weight loss surgery that you're looking at, which can give you up to 30% of weight loss. What about other pharmacological agents we can use in terms of management of fatty liver disease? So these are the medications that are currently available. They target various things such as insulin resistance, as well as oxidative stress, such as in the vitamin A. It is important to note with metformin that although it is the cornerstone of therapy of type 2 diabetes, um, it is not, it has not been proven to have any effect on his liver histology in fatty liver disease. So it is still good for type 2 diabetes, but I wouldn't necessarily use it mainly for NASH if you don't have any type 2 diabetes. Pioglitazone, on the other hand, and vitamin E are both recommended to be used in patients with biopsy-proven NASH. They have been studied in multiple trials and have been shown to show improvement of NASH resolution. They have been also shown to uh, cause improvements of NAFLD activity score of more than two scores when they've been used in clinical trials as well. So um, what are the options really? So we know metformin is okay to use in type two diabetes, but not necessarily for primarily to treat NAF uh, NAFLD. Uh, Pioglitazone on the other hand have been shown to improve liver histology. Same with vitamin E when we use at 800 international units a day it has been shown to improve liver histology in non-diabetic adults. So how do we currently manage patients? So there are currently four different target areas that we can consider. So we can first look at the cardiovascular risk. We can start to reduce their cardiovascular risk profile by treating their metabolic syndrome, such as their hypertension or dyslipidemia. And then we can look into treating, starting treatment that direct into, directly treat their liver, such as their vitamin E, pioglitazone or liraglutide. Um, and then we can look at controlling their obesity. So with weight loss programs, such as diet, exercise, drugs, as well as bariatric surgery, and finally reduce cancer risk. Um, and metformin and zimpastatin, interestingly, have been shown in a number of cross-sectional data to, uh, to be reduced, to be associated with reduced liver cancer risk. What about the use of statin with um, patients with NASH? So the current statement is that clinical trials of statins as treatment for NASH are limited. They have been shown to have inconsistent results. So I wouldn't necessarily use it for patients who have normal cholesterol profile uh, just to treat their fatty liver disease. But in patients who have hyperlipidemia, NASH, uh, statin is definitely beneficial and it has been associated with reduction of cardiovascular disease risk factors. So I would still use it for those people. And the next thing that I just wanted to highlight is this topic about Lynn Maffold. 
So as we all have noticed, not all fatty liver disease patients are obese. The BMI is not a very good indicator of obesity, as we can tell um, from this picture that someone who can be as fit as a bodybuilder can have the same BMI as someone who's extremely obese. This lean map will actually present in 20% of all fatty liver disease patients. And although it was first recognized to be a phenomenon in Asia, Asian pa uh, patients, we now have seen this in a lot of the other Caucasian as well. So it's defined as patients who have normal BMI, so 25 in Caucasians or less than 23 in Asians, or normal waist circumference, but have altered metabolic profile and hepatic steatosis on ultrasound imaging or biopsy. They tend to have favorable liver histology at baseline, but interestingly, these patients tend to progress even quicker than the classic obese fatty liver disease patients, and they tend to have a worse mortality and accelerated liver disease complications in the long-term studies. The exact underlying pathogenesis is not well understood. There's some studies that shows that there is some genetic components to it, as well as their metabolic profile in terms of how they process fat and deposit fat around the body, which can contribute to this uh, pathogenesis. So I guess the main take home message that I wanted to uh, convey across today is that MAFL is a very common disease. It's a heterogeneous spectrum of disease, which can range from the benign steatosis to the steatohepatitis where there is inflammation, scarring, and eventually leads to cirrhosis. And it is the severity of liver fibrosis that's uh, the most important and independent predictor of bad liver outcomes in fatty liver disease. So we need to focus our diagnostic efforts to identify individuals who are at risk of fibrosis, detecting them early and staging them to determine their prognosis and guide their management. Patients with fatty liver disease as well, who also have obesity and type two diabetes are at high risk of progression to NASH and cardiovascular disease. And the goals of management for these people really should be directed uh, directed at reducing the patient's risk of MAFL progression, focusing on the weight loss and minimizing cardiovascular disease risk. And this includes multiple dis multidisciplinary involvement involving the primary healthcare professionals, dietitians, CNCs, hepatologists, endocrinologists, cardiologists, and sometimes even the bariatric surgeon. So this is just a really nice flow chart of um, summary of how we manage patients who have hepatic steatosis. So once we have fatty liver diagnosed on the ultrasounds, we then det determine the risk of advanced fibrosis. We can use simple calculators such as the NIFOL fibrosis score or the FIB4. They're very good at excluding patients uh, without cirrhosis. So if they have really low scores, then we can absolutely be sure that they have low risk of advanced fibrosis and we can manage them usually in the community by assessing their cardiovascular risk, considering statin, diabetes management, alcohol management, weight loss, and all that stuff. If they have high risk uh, or high scores, then they're classified as ha having risk or increased risk of advanced fibrosis. And these are the patients who definitely need referral to the liver clinic for ongoing management and assessment of liver disease, screening of portal hypertension, and ongoing HCC surveillance. For those who fall sort of in the middle who are indeterminate, the next thing we can do is uh, perform other tests to diagnose fibrosis, such as the fiber scan. If the fiber scan is low and they're usually very good at excluding fibrosis, then we can manage them as a low risk patient. If their fibrosis is in indeterminate or high, then we can classify them as likely having higher risk fibrosis and refer them on for further assessment. Um, so I'll hand over back to Carly to talk about the health pathways. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. I think it's going to take me a while to get used to the name change from NAFLD to MAFLD. Um, but before we open up for questions, I just wanted to mainly around the, the identification of the risk of fibrosis for patients and also the detection, as Dr. Chen was saying. Um, I wanted to highlight the clinical pathways that are available for you on the health pathway site. So this includes the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease pathway, a chronic hepatitis B and chronic hepatitis C, as well as abnormal liver function tests as well. And just on the next slide, I just also like to highlight the new referral form that we have began to utilize. Um, so the purpose of this form is just to improve the efficiency in our triaging process, but it's also to just highlight the need to address changes uh, to the Medicare stipulations regarding accepting physicians. And you can see probably the most important thing I just wanted to highlight while we have you all here today, just where that red circle is at the top. So that is now um, a compulsory on all referrals coming through to our liver clinic service that a clinician needs to be noted within the referral instead of just a generic referral to our liver clinic. So if you are looking at sending us a referral through for a patient that you have concerns about, just making sure that the clinician name of whom you'd like to refer the patient to is listed there. On the back of the form, there's, there's a whole heap of clinicians within our liver service that you can choose from as well. And just going back on that last page, it's just a screenshot as well of the contact details for our department. As I mentioned previously, all patients that are known to our service that are discharged and going to be having follow up with our service will also have my contact details there just as a point of contact if there are any concerns after that patient's um, discharge from hospital. But if there is a patient that you are looking at referring or you have questions about that referral process, the contact details for myself as well as our hepatitis B clinical nurse consultant are on there and also uh, the email address for our admin team for referral processes as well. So I will open up for questions now also. Okay, so I've got a question here for you, Dr. Chen, can patients with a low BMI around 19 have fatty liver disease and fibrosis? And if so, what is the treatment? Um, yes. So this uh, goes back to the uh, lean mafold phenomenon that I was talking about. So definitely can. Um, and like we said before, these patients tend to have late diagnosis because they don't expect to have fatty liver disease. And usually they're only picked up on random routine screening for other purposes, such as pre-op, or other routine sort of blood tests uh, yearly. And, and a, a lot of the times these patients all were already tend to have quite advanced fibrosis um, sometimes as well, which is surprising. So yes, they can have fatty liver disease and develop fibrosis as well. Unfortunately, treatment is still very difficult at this stage. Um, if they don't have diabetes, we can try some vitamin E tablets. Uh, we tend to have to control their metabolic risk factors aggressively. So check their cholesterols, blood sugars, uh, blood pressure, and control all those factors. Obviously we, can't, obviously, we can't get them to lose weight if their BMI is already low. So we can only manage them by managing their metabolic risk factors. And hopefully in the near future, when some of our clinical trials um, have become available, we'll have more antifibrotic treatments specifically directed at treatment of fibrosis, uh, which will be available for this cohort of patients as well. But at the moment, they're still on clinical trial in the clinical trial process, so. And I think one of the important points to highlight as well is with these group of patients that obviously there's, there's not much treatment wise that we are able to offer. The importance if they do have a, a, a moderate to high level of fibrosis that they are referred across to our service so that we can continue monitoring them for those ongoing risk factors that can occur um, in relation to the high fibrosis level. So particularly HCC screening. So we're more than happy for those patients to be referred across to us. So so that they can go on our HCC surveillance monitoring program as well. Um, one of the other questions uh, around the pharmacological agents for weight loss, um, are they available for prescriptions by um, general practice? Uh, yes, so I think recently two of our GLP-1 agonists are available now on 
to be uh, on TGA approved for weight loss uh, and they don't need to have diabetes. So the first is liraglutide. Liraglutide used to uh, only be available for diabetes, but it's now available as well for the purpose of weight loss. And the other one now is semaglutide as well, which is available for weight loss purposes. Um, so they don't need to have diabetes uh, to be commenced on these medications. And they have been shown to have good impact on weight loss, which eventually leads to improvement of their fatty liver disease as well. Um, and yeah, they don't need to be prescribed by specialists. Um, anyone can prescribe them. Fantastic. And last question as well. Obviously, there are a lot of risk factors for MAFLD. How a general practitioner's, um, you know, what at what point is referral to our service appropriate? Obviously, we cannot be reviewing every patient with hypertension or dyslipidemia or who is a little bit overweight. So how would we um, sort of triage, you know, at what point referral to a tertiary service is appropriate? Yeah, so once we suspect that someone has fatty liver disease, um, as confirmed by ultrasound, uh, either have abnormal liver function tests, for example, then we calculate their risks for fibrosis. Obviously, we need to rule out other causes of steatosis as well. So look at their medications. Are they on high dose steroids or long term steroids, for example? Um, look at their other risk factors. Are they drinking a lot of alcohol as well, which can cause fatty liver disease? But once we've ruled out all that stuff, we then do a simple calculator of a fibrosis score. And if their score is intermediate to high, then those are the patients that we refer to clinic for, for their assessment. So we can do a fiber scan, we can monitor them uh, for ongoing complications or portal hypertension and their um, HCC surveillance as well. We tend to now have a lower threshold of putting people on HCC surveillance if they have F2, F3 and onwards fibrosis on FibroScan, even though we know that FibroScan can be dubious in that mid range, F2 to F3 range, just because we've seen a lot of patients who suddenly have HCC just because their FibroScan was F2 a couple of years ago. But more importantly, if you have any doubts about any patients who have abnormal liver function tests or hepatic steatosis that you're not sure, it is better just to get them referred on just for further assessment. And if we think that they can be managed in the community, then we'll assess them and we'll give you a management plan in terms of just manage their risk factors, and manage their alcohol, for example, and monitor their blood test sort of every six to 12 months. And then if there's any doubt, send them back again. And utilizing the clinical nurse consultants as I just popped on that last slide as well, for questions like that is, um, is more than appropriate. We can always bring them in for a fiber scan and assess them and then uh, refer them back if they don't need any further follow-up. Um, I just have one more question. We are jumping across to um, primary biliary cirrhosis now, but what are the blood tests used to diagnose primary biliary cirrhosis and do we assess these patients? Yes, we do. And can a patient have a normal abdominal ultrasound and how do you treat PBC? Uh, yes, so the antibody we use is uh, AMA, so anti-mitochondrial antibodies but some PPC patients have negative AMA. So it's usually a combination of having cholestatic blood tests, cholestatic liver function tests, either having a positive AMA. The last thing is liver biopsy. So if at any one point there is a suggestion that it, is, it could be PBC, then we do a liver biopsy to confirm that. And once we diagnose it, the treatment at the moment is also deoxycholic acid. So 20 milligrams per kilograms a day. Um, a day. But yes, we do see PBC patients in the clinic. And from memory on the abnormal liver function test pathway, um, I believe that the list of the chronic liver panel pathology tests are within that pathway from memory. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Well, if there are, let me just double check that there, so there's no other questions. Bertha, would you like us to wrap up for the morning so that everybody can get to their busy schedules if there's no other questions? I think we can end it there. Thank you so much, Carly, and thank you, Dr. Chen, for a very comprehensive presentation this morning. Thank you, everybody, for attending.